Thanks very much. It's a pleasure to be here and really um, a privilege for us all to listen to people's live stories because in a conference setting you never get to hear what we've heard this morning. And I think uh, from our point of view, just sitting in the front row, it's been uh, very illuminating. And I think what you'll find is that a lot of our stories are very similar. And I actually wasn't going to confess how I made my decisions along the way, but since the Dean did, I thought I may as well confess as well. So I was asked really to uh, tell you how to spending time with a patient can focus the research question. And I thought the best way to do that would be just to give you some examples from my own work. But I thought I would t tell you how I reached where I got to um, through my life journey as well, as you've heard earlier today. So I started uh, in Shepparton. Uh, I grew up uh, two hours away from here. My parents were both school teachers. And uh, coming from the country, it had always been something that I thought I would uh, return to. I did my medical training at the uh, Melbourne University. And then I went to the Royal Melbourne Hospital at the time. You had to do a couple of years um, before you entered a, a specialty training, and, and you also had to sit a first part. So when I thought to do ophthalmology, um, there was three years I had to spend at a hospital before um, being able to be um, included in that training, and you had to sit this incredibly hard um, first part. That actually took me three times to, to uh, pass. I passed it on the, first, the third time. So at the hospital, I thought initially, like Fiona, I might like to be a plastic surgeon, but then I thought if someone collapsed in front of me, then how would I know how to help them if I was a plastic surgeon? So I thought well, that would be no good. I better do a physician training. And then when I was at the Royal Melbourne doing physician training with um, Professor Kincaid Smith, it was far too hard. I thought this is too hard. Can't do this. Surely if I did ophthalmology, it was a small thing. Surely you could learn all there was to know about ophthalmology. And at the time at the Royal Melbourne, there were quite dynamic uh, ophthalmologists. So I tried to sit the first part by being a neurosurgical registrar with Andrew Kay, and it was just very hard to do to find the time. And so I thought I had to use my time in the best way possible to try and get this uh, first part exam. And most of my contemporaries went to the anatomy school and were demonstrators. But I thought well, I best perhaps do something a bit different. And the Walter and Eliza was just across the road. And I thought, well, I'll do some research, not three years. That would be far too long. I would just start there and see how that went. And I I, there was really only one person doing eye research, and that was in transplantation immunology. I was looking at the cornea as an example of a, a tissue that was able to be transplanted uh, successfully. So I worked on transplantation immunology at the Walton Eliza, and I was there, and I thought, this is a pretty good place. I'll apply for a scholarship, and I got an NHMRC scholarship for a PhD, so I thought, I may as well stay three years. And people said, why are you doing this? And I said, you know, it's really an end in itself. It's a, a useful thing to have, but I had certainly no intention of being a researcher. As I said, I was going back to Shepparton as a country ophthalmologist. Because I had lots of time on my hand, because all I was doing was my PhD and trying to see this first part, I was asked to join a group of uh, eye doctors um, who used to travel to the um, South Pacific uh, giving um, ophthalmic care. And to that point, they'd never taken a girl because uh, I think wives probably put up their hands and said, you can't go if there are women on the team. But because they really needed someone at a short notice to fill in for someone that was unable to go, I was the first uh, girl to be able to go on this very enjoyable uh, third world sort of uh, uh, team that, that delivered eye care. And this was in um, Vanuatu. And uh, you can see that the transportation probably didn't uh, satisfy any occupational health and safety at the time. Uh, and you can also understand perhaps why they didn't really uh, think that it was a good place perhaps for a young female to be. But I went along and it was a terrific experience. Uh, the accommodation uh, was less than ideal to start with. Um, this was the sort of... Um, places that we got to stay, but it certainly had some luxurious uh, um, accommodation uh, later on in the trip. So that was really my first uh, introduction to what perhaps life as an ophthalmologist could uh, uh, involve. And so I eventually passed that first part on the third attempt and then went and did my uh, ophthalmology training after my PhD at the Ionia Hospital. And just to, on that question of when to do a PhD, so my PhD is in 
um, immunology of transplantation and my work has been in age-related macular degeneration and actually they probably had nothing to do with each other except just now after I've forgotten all about what I did in my PhD, AMD may well be an immune uh, disease but I probably don't remember anything that I learned. So I think what uh, the Dean was saying that the further along when you know what you want to use uh, in your research would be a good time to do your your PhD because I think it's a bit of a shame that I wasn't able to uh, potentially use what I learned in my PhD in its sort of fundamental nature in my, my work. Anyhow, I did my uh, uh, training in ophthalmology uh, at the Iron Ear Hospital and again if you were embracing opportunities that came your way, um, you could uh, uh, learn some of your hone your skills in, in the training of the surgery with the Fred Hollows Foundation and this is in Nepal and uh, cataracts are a very common cause of poor vision in people in third worlds and you can see this gentleman here has a white pupil so he has a very dense cataract and just at the time we were helping uh, third world countries to, uh, make the intraocular lenses that you can see in the corner there to put into to eyes but prior to that we used to take out the cataracts and leave them with very thick glasses so as a final year trainee we were able to if we wished to embrace the opportunity to go and uh, do some surgery uh, in Nepal and you can see here uh, that's the waiting room and that's the uh, scrub room and uh, that's the operating theatre which was uh, in a school uh, up on the, um, the track going to, to Everest. And so uh, I had this opportunity to do some surgery and you can see in the bucket there all the uh, cataracts that uh, were taken out in a day's work and people coming to this uh, facility were often uh, led by their grandchildren with a stick because they were blind and that's how they travelled for days to get across the mountains to, to the cataract camp. But uh, at the end of, of a, a week's work you had this uh, very um, amazing experience of having known that you had impacted uh, tremendously on these people's lives by uh, at least letting one eye uh, start to see again. And so it is no wonder at the end of that that I was you know, convinced that this was uh, certainly something that was uh, a very uh, useful profession to undertake and, and again I was still heading back to, to Shepparton to be a general ophthalmologist. But I thought that I needed to know a little bit more about retinal diseases and my interest was in that plastic surgery so I thought I would like to do two more things for my fellowship before I went back to Shepparton. I really did not know where I wanted to go but the textbook that we used had all these photos by this man, it was all courtesy of Alan Bird and I thought well he clearly has an interesting practice, why don't I go and see whether I could work with Alan Bird and literally that was how I chose where to do my fellowship. He came from a place called Moorfields Eye Hospital in England, I had no idea it was the world's leading eye hospital in uh, eye diseases but he had a lot of interesting patients so I contacted him. I had an interview with him around a pool at a conference on a Sunday morning. I rang him up and I said it was me and I understood he looked like Sean Connery and that's how I would know him when I saw him at the swimming pool and I said I looked like Elle McPherson but uh, <laughs> I had to confess that that probably wasn't going to be how he would find me. But anyhow we had this conversation. I said I wanted to be a country ophthalmologist. I, had no, I was very naive. I did not know that he would probably choose people that were wanting to be the next professors because that's what you do. You try and choose people for fellowships who will go on and represent you around the world. So I just said it as it was and that probably wasn't the right thing to say but he rang a few people in Melbourne who said I don't think that she'll go back to Shepparton as a country ophthalmologist should take her and so I then went uh, to Moorfields Eye Hospital uh, in London. I was the first ophthalmologist actually to get a travelling scholarship from our College of Surgeons. Ophthalmology doesn't rank highly in terms of surgical specialties so that was terrific that they gave me a stipend because at least at that time a fellowship was not paid, you did not get an income from doing your fellowship, it was sort of enforced poverty but you knew that you were there, you were there for a reason. Uh, and as part of being uh, part of this hospital you were also part of the University Col uh, College London. 
where you could, uh, if you wish to, partake in some of their research projects. And also I guess my part of my message would be just to take any opportunity that comes your way. If you were uh, wanted to, you could take part in a, a survey of sickle cell in Jamaica, and I was lucky enough to be able to go twice uh, during my fellowship to, to look at uh, um, people in Jamaica in terms of sickle cell disease. But I think if there's one thing I can suggest is that uh, the opportunity to work overseas is a, a remarkable experience in itself to see how other medical um, systems work, but it's the fellowship and I think over and again what you he heard this morning is the people that you meet and the people that you work with. And quite literally these people that I met in my fellowship now over 20 years ago, uh, I meet at conferences every year, uh, we work together as colleagues and collaborators and it's a wonderful opportunity, all, we were all poor together, I grew my hair because I saved money on hair, haircuts and we weren't eating meat because we couldn't afford it but it was the mad cow era so that was probably good. Um, <laughs> And so it's really that uh, lifelong uh, uh, collaborations that you, you, um, you get from all around the world who come together to learn. And interestingly, this medical retinal specialty that I decided to come and learn more about just because uh, I thought that it was very common and then when I went back to the country that would be something that I would need. So it was diabetes, it was blood vessel disease. Um, it wasn't really a, a very sexy thing to do because there was no surgery involved in medical retina, yet we all went into ophthalmology thinking we liked the, the surgery. And so one of these ladies in this picture was the first medical retinal uh, fellow in the UK to ever have done this fellowship because certainly in the UK to be able to operate meant that you could sort of boost your income. So it wasn't a very popular thing to do amongst ophthalmology. And indeed in Melbourne at the time there was only one medical retinal specialist uh, who was uh, currently working in Melbourne and now everyone wants to be one of these medical retinal specialists. But at the time it was certainly not a thing that one did. So just to bring you up to speed with retinal diseases, so the retina is what I tell patients, it's like the film in the camera uh, and it uh, is responsible uh, for this disease called age-related macular degeneration and it, it overwhelmingly is the commonest cause of poor vision in our communities. Anyone over 50 is at risk of this disease and you can see here it is a major impact on why people don't see as they get older. This is a normal retina on your left and on your right are these little deposits called drusen that develop uh, in one in seven people over 50. And they are the beginnings of age-related macular degeneration or AMD. If you have a problem with this disease, you get distorted vision and you can see they're bleeding in your retina. And that uh, is not very good for seeing. And in the 90s when we were doing this at Moorfields, this was the end result. And you can see very much that there is uh, a very poor outcome for people uh, in terms of seeing. And so that question that I was asked to talk about was how might a patient help clinician focus their research, remembering I'm there being a country ophthalmologist in the making, and when you spend every clinic seeing people uh, with this disease, with no, nothing that you can do to treat them. People would fly from all around the world to these evening clinics that we ran uh, as a private clinic with this Professor Bird who was the world leader in this disease. We basically thanked people for coming and we asked them to come back when their other eye had the same problem. I'm not sure why, because there was nothing that we could do. We were very polite. We were very, always thanked our patients for coming to see us and, and sent them home again. And you can see that, that right from that moment that you could one, have no impact in the clinic, but it was a disease just needing some research, being the most common cause of poor vision. So how, how could you have that without people doing research in it? So that's basically when I, I remember the day as well that I thought, well, how many patients, I could make a tape recording and sit it in the clinic to explain what had happened, why I hadn't had any treatment except for perhaps laser occasionally. Uh, and I could only impact then, not even very well, on a, a certain number of patients. But if I went away and tried to work out what was causing this disease, then the impact would be greater. And literally that was uh, life changing from being a country clinician to a researcher. So then I went to uh, very unsexy old people, no surgery, no treatment, very sad in the clinic, uh, and not very easy to pick up you know, husbands. Um, you know, uh, it wasn't something that, that was very uh, catching when you told people that's what you did. 
Anyhow, I then returned to Australia and at the time Professor Hugh Taylor uh, was taking the University Department of Ophthalmology and turning it into a research institute called the Centre for Eye Research Australia. So there was about three of us uh, in that uh, department and that was in 1997. But uh, it was, so it grew out of the University Department of Ophthalmology, it's sort of like the WEHA, it's now a, a, an independent research institute. Um, but I also have a private practice across the road, so you can see the hospital from my rooms. And I was also a clinician at the Royal Victorian Eye and Ear Hospital. And so the idea was being cl a clinician scientist, you, you bridged that gap between one side was the hospital and the other side uh, was um, the Centre for Eye Research Australia. So really in your day-to-day -day work, as we sort of start at this session this morning, you put on three hats when you, when you get up in the morning. You really needed to, you, were, you weren't really working one or the other, the whole thing worked together. And even in private practice, my patients come either because they want to be in a trial, they want to have that third uh, opinion as to their disease. So the first thing in the 1990s, how would you say, solve a disease that you really had no idea what caused it or what a treatment was? Well, you would look for a gene. And this was before there were GWASs that you had to collect families, you had to collect um, blood. And so I guess my other point is you don't have to have skills on stem cells or how you do single cell sequencing, you just really have to be a good clinician to be able to uh, impact. And so by just collecting patients and phenotyping their disease uh, and then let the smart people do their work, you can still make a, a good contribution. So when I came back in 1997, we basically saw families and twins and travelled around Australia connecting families with this disease. Then you can see down the bottom, we went to aged care home. It was not an easy thing to do. We, our, ca our, ca our camera table lost a wheel. Uh, we didn't have much money to, to buy uh, sexy equipment, but we basically collected uh, what is now a world-renowned resource of people with uh, age-related macular degeneration. And at the time, what you were trying to do was to find a gene that caused a disease that was a dominantly inherited disease that was um, rare and hope that that gene would contribute to AMD. And you can see here, to be a good clinician, to be able to identify different diseases that somewhat look the same and put them into right, the correct piles uh, was a, a huge advantage for the, the basic scientists in the laboratory. And right when we were trying to find the genes for AMD, all these genes for similar diseases were falling out. But this was the big one that no one really could find the gene for. It looked the most like AMD and this was really the prize that everyone wanted to, to know what the gene was. And I had started working on these families uh, in the UK and when I came back I continued and it just so happened that in Australia we have had a large family of 20 children of this lady that won Mother of the Year um, because of her uh, 20 children and they uh, were affected by this disease. And my first grant was for $10,000 and it gave me the ability to buy a much smaller camera that we could go and visit people in their homes to collect uh, their photos and their blood. And so this is really just to say that uh, people have been looking for this gene for, for years and they'd had families collected uh, around the world but they really couldn't get the interval small enough to actually interrogate the genome. And it really, uh, so our family provided that opportunity but I was constantly asked, am I really sure that this is the right disease? Uh, and so really it was that clinical expertise that, that mattered in this case. And then, I know I'm running out of time, but just to say, um, someone else thought that they had found a gene for a different disease, but they were sure this was the one that caused AMD. It looked a bit like this. We thought this didn't look anything like age-related macular generation. And it was really going to the uh, Housing Commission houses in North Melbourne, where we knew there were African uh, people living, to actually show that, in fact, you have to know your control population. In America, people just sort of dumped all this uh, DNA on in, in genetic uh, groups, but if you actually know your patients, you know whether they're African, and, and we were able to show that this particular uh, variation in the DNA was actually just a normal variant in, in this uh, Negro population in America, uh, rather than um, a cause of a disease. But by being a good clinician, we then were able to team up with people who actually did find the genes that uh, were associated with AMD. And, and I'm on a pattern, so every time someone wants to know whether they've got a gene for AMD, I get a cent or so um, for, for doing the clinical work associated with this. 
With regard to the treatment for AMD, there was a major impact uh, in, in the early 2000s of the first um, treatment that you would uh, give somebody as an injection in the eye. And the fact that you could take someone from your clinic at the Ionia Hospital and give them for the first time in, in, in living history uh, an opportunity to take part in the trial really meant that the patient uh, had to trust you. No one had given these injections in the eye before on multiple occasions. So I think it was a privilege to be able to ask patients to, to come on that journey with you as the, the clinician in this research. And so as a result of being part of that, we changed the outcome from the natural history uh, to, to really making a huge impact on, on their vision from being a blinding disease to now um, we have um, reduced the, the blindness from that disease. So I think I'll finish there, uh, just giving you a couple of indications of where just being a simple clinician uh, without having to run a laboratory can really make a big impact on uh, on. Uh, patient's outcome and it's that privilege of taking, having them believe that you're going to do the right thing for them to try out these new treatments. Thank you.